Growing up in a deep mountain village in China was difficult, in many ways. My family was reasonably well off, you see, since my parents had good jobs in Shanghai, but not all the families get this lucky. I had childhood friends who lived in shabby hovels and ate sweet potatoes for lunch every day. I never know what happened to them after I left the village at 13 to join my parents for better education and now my family has migrated to Australia. Maybe our road will never cross, but sometimes I still think of those friends and think of my days spent in the mountain village. I was born in Shanghai, where my parents had been living for many years. They went to university there, worked there, met each other there, and got married there. So I was born there. It was all right at first. We were a small, average but happy family. However, when I was five, dad got promoted and mom got a new job, and they were both too busy to look after me, so I was sent back to the little village where my father grew up, and they got my grandparents to look after me. I was resentful to go there at first, because I was so used to big city life, full of entertainment and excitement. The little village could not possibly compare to Shanghai. We had a TV at home all right, but only a few channels could be received. And they were full of boring stuff. Books were rare as well. Sometimes my parents sent books back to me, but only one or two, and I got bored of them soon. Barely no toys, unless you count those small guns and bows made by the boys. They wouldn't let us touch them anyway. But there was one thing that I loved the most, one that you can't get in the cities. The evening story time. On summer days, after supper, all the children gather in the yard around the olds. We watched the stars, ate fruits and nuts, chatted to each other, and listened to the stories. Sometimes they told us stories about the fairies in heaven, the Chinese version, the legends of the monkey king, and the stories of emperors in history, all fascinating stories. Some of the olds were good at storytelling, Grandma Wang especially. Whenever she was telling stories, the kids all held their breath and listened quietly, even if we were all scared to hell by her stories. She didn't tell those legends. She told stories that happened in our village. The stories that no one could explain. And here is one that kept me away from the west side of our village for a long time. I will retell the story from Grandma Wang's POV. Chin's husband had gone mad. The word spread quickly. It was nearly midnight, but all the adults jumped out of their beds as soon as they heard the news, grabbed their clothes, and rushed to Chin's home. Some of those, the relatives of the family, were there to help, but most of them were only there to watch. The life in a mountain village was boring indeed, you see. I was about 15 at that time, and I was already considered as a half-adult, so I followed my parents to the scene, leaving my two younger siblings fast asleep at home. Children were not supposed to see things like this, as their eyes were clean and they could sometimes see something that shouldn't be seen. When we got there, Chin was holding her five-year-old son Tiger and crying hard in her sister-in-law's arms in the middle of the yard. Relatives stood in there with them, villagers stood outside, but no one dared to enter the house, in which Chin's husband, Six, was wandering around and laughing loudly and unceasingly. There was something unsettling in that laughter, even in human. I still feel like shivering when I think of that sound. At that time, we had an old lady in the village who could tell fortune and cast away the dirty things, whose name was Grandma Chang. She lived a bit far from the other villagers, higher up on the mountain, so it took her about half an hour or so to get to Chen's house in an ox cart. When she arrived, most people had already been satisfied with the drama and went home to get some sleep, but Chin's brother and his wife, several friends of six and my family stayed, father was a second cousin to six. Grandma Chang got off the cart, walked slowly and a bit wobbly into the yard and paused at the entrance of the house. Her facial expression was unreadable as usual. Serious and maybe a bit sad. Then she sighed and turned to the family. Get the child out of here. She ordered. Chin was unwilling to let her baby go, reasonable, since witnessing her husband gone mad left her lonely and insecure. But then, everyone in the village listened to Grandma Chang. So the task went to me since I was the youngest, and it wasn't proper for me to be there with them. I had to take Tiger back to our home, and stay put until my parents informed me otherwise. 
I was a curious teenager so I really didn't want to leave. Plus, Six and Chin were always good to me, and I did care about them, but as a child I had no place to disobey the old and my parents. I took Tiger and left. The road back home was dark and quiet, because we did not have lamps at that time and everyone had settled down again. I did not learn the whole story until my parents were back, but I was glad that I didn't. What Tiger told me on the way was already unnerving enough. His eyes looked distant, and when I tried to comfort him, he whispered to me in a shaky voice. I saw a woman in a red dress on Daddy's shoulders. She smiled at me. I'm scared. My parents were not back until it was dawn. I was too nervous to sleep, so I lit a candle and sat on the bed where my siblings were sleeping and started to sew. Tiger was also terrified, but he was still a child, so eventually he fell asleep. I remember sitting up all night, just by myself, staring at the door in an unknowing fear. We did not have a light, or phone, or TV. All I had was the small candle light, and once in a while, a whimper or mumble of the kids. You could imagine my relief when the sky finally began to light up, and my parents' voices sounded in the yard when they came back. The relief did not last long, though. My parents had that tired and sad expression on their face, and instantly I knew something was not right. I looked at Tiger's little face, and my heart broke a bit for him. They signaled me to step out in the yard to talk, not wishing to wake the kids up. So I went out and closed the door behind me carefully. Six is in grave danger. Father told me in a low voice. Mother was sobbing quietly. Six was not a bad person, and he was very close to our family. I felt tear welling up in my eyes, but what happened? You remember Chow Lin? Father asked, and of course I did. Chow was from another village, and she was newly married to a young man in our place. They were supposed to be a happy couple, if only the tragedy did not happen. Chow was going back to see her family the other day, but it was raining so heavily the night before and the road in the mountain became very unsafe. Her husband worried a lot and tried to persuade her not to leave, but she set out in the morning anyway and never made it back home. They found her dead in the valley along the way, five days later. She must have slipped and fell. That happened about a month ago. The young man was heartbroken and he left the village after the funeral. Chow was buried near her house, which was on the west end of the village. It was her home, and was closer to her hometown, the village to the west of ours, than the other cemeteries at the east end. Her death was a sudden death, and it was believed by many that the spirit of those who suffered sudden death would not rest peacefully. They had too many dreams that would never be realized, and too many regrets that would never be compensated. I did not understand what Chow Lin had to do with six. It wasn't like Six killed her, was it? No, Father sighed, it was because of her tomb. As I said, the tomb of Chow was near her house, along the road, at the west end of our village. The evening before, Six and three friends of his went to the other village to have a drink with their buddies. They didn't come back until it was very late, and they were very drunk. Along the way, they sang and laughed loudly, but as they were approaching the village, the new tomb, they subconsciously became quiet. You remember Chow, I? One of the friends, Pao, asked. Hell yeah, man. I was there when they found her. Poor thing, died like that. Housie, which literally means mouse, in some villages the parents gave their children silly names and believed they could keep them safe, answered, pity, Chow was such a pretty chick. Have some respect for the dead, bro the other friend, Chuang, whispered. What's your problem, Chuang? Have some nerves. Pao patted the man's back. You're such a coward. Six, drunk as he was, suddenly laughed out loud and prompted a game. How about, he joked, we have a competition and see who's the bravest. Pao and Housie cheered in agreement, but Chuang shook his head. Whatever you're thinking about, I'm out. And I suggest you quit it as well, brothers. It's not going to be good. The three drunk men just laughed at Chuang and waved him off. The man shook his head again and headed towards the village on his own, praying that the others were not going to get themselves in trouble. So among the three, a competition began. 
What Six suggested was that they take turns to insult Chow's tomb. She was a chick, man. Six waved his hands. I bet she wouldn't dare to do anything to us. The other two agreed. At the beginning they were just verbally insulting her, calling her names, and saying filthy things. But as they got excited it wasn't enough anymore. Pow poured half a bottle of beer on her tombstone. Normally it was like paying tribute to the dead, but the way he did it was just offensive. Then Housie kicked over a plate of fruit in front of the tomb. Chow's husband left it there for her before he left. And eventually, Six did the most forbidden thing. He picked up a wood stick and began to dig holes on the tomb. He didn't even finish the first when a horrible wind appeared, spinning on the ground in front of the tomb, blowing up dirt into the men's face. They were woken up a bit by the wind and realized at once that they did something terrible, that Chow's spirit was angry, so they looked at each other, horrified, and dashed back to the village as fast as possible. Right after Six rushed back to his house, he passed out. And when he woke up again to his worried wife and kid, he began to laugh hysterically. That was what happened at the beginning. After Grandma Chang got the whole story from the three friends, her expression became even more serious and sad. No wonder she is so angry, she said, which scared the crap out of Pao and Housie. Chin was pale and too shocked to speak, but the others... Chen's brother and his wife, my parents, and Chuang just exchanged a heavy look. Chuang regretted that he should have talked his friends out of it, but Grandma Chang just shook her head. That's fate, kid. You couldn't change that, she said. Then she turned to Chen, take some paper money, the offering to the dead, to the tomb tomorrow and apologize, but Chow may or may not forgive you. I will be there to talk to her, but I can only do that much. You two should come too. She turned again, facing Pao and Housie. Six was just the first. She is going after you once she'd finished him. Chin let out a weak cry, and the two men began to shake. So the next day, the family of Six dragged him. He was still laughing weakly once in a while. He was in a bad shape as you can imagine, after a long night without any sleep and just kept laughing. Chin wasn't better off either, and you can see the bags under her eyes. I went along with them, taking Tiger with me. It was a special situation and they needed the whole family to be there, that was why Tiger was allowed to come. Pao's family came with us, him, his wife, and his three kids. Chuang came along, too, but Housie was nowhere to be seen though. He was single, with no relatives to look out for him, as his parents passed away when he was still a kid and their family kind of did not wish to take another burden in, so they distanced from him. He never went to school or had any kind of work, which meant that he had no income. He lived on borrowed money, except that he never returned them. All the wives in the village hated him for that, but he was on good terms with the men. They were drinking buddies, you see. So before we headed for the tomb, we went to Housie's small house and asked him to come along. But he refused, even when Grandma Chang demanded him to come. Said he was too afraid. The men wanted to force him to come with us, since Grandma Chang said that horrible things would happen if he didn't. But Housie ended up shutting his door. Eventually, Grandma Chang let out a sigh and told them to give up. The actual journey to the tomb was uneventful. We went through the procedure of incensing, burning up paper money and offering food on plates. Then Grandma Chang began lighting a piece of foo, charms written on paper, and mumbling under her breath in a language that we could not understand. It went on for a few minutes, and suddenly, the weird wind appeared. We saw it dance on the tomb for three seconds or so, and disappeared into it. I gaped at that, it was the first time I saw anything like this. But the adults didn't seem shocked at all. Grandma Chang stepped back a bit, sighed again, and she looked so tired and old. Everyone at the scene was deadly silent, waiting for her to announce the men's fate. You are forgiven. She finally, finally spit out. I felt so relieved. Six would be all right, their family would be fine. It was kind of chow, I thought. But my relief was short-lived, as Pao hesitatingly asked, but what about Housie? Grandma Chang looked as if she wanted to say something, but she eventually just shook her head. We all knew that something wasn't quite right, but did not ask. 
As the old saying goes, you cannot leak out the secret of heaven. So if she decided to keep her silence, we would not press her. The next day, Halsey went missing. He was not found until exactly five days later, at the same spot where Chow's body was found. My father was in a searching group, and he told me it disturbed him that they actually searched that area quite a few times in those five days, but did not see any trace of the man. But there were so many things I could not understand about it. Like, why would Housie refuse to come to the tomb? And what did Grandma Chang learn at the tomb? I could only guess. But for a long time after that, everyone in the village tried their best to avoid going near the west side of the village. I still do.